This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show looking at China, where Xi Jinping has begun a historic third term as head of the Chinese Communist Party. The decision came over the weekend during the party's Congress, which is held every five years. There was also a major shakeup of the seven-member Politburo Standing Committee, which is China's most powerful governing body. China's premier, Li Keqiang, longtime rival to Xi, was demoted while four Xi loyalists were promoted. The party's top official in Shanghai, Li Chang, appears set to become China's new premier. He's a close ally of Xi. He oversaw the harsh COVID crackdown in Shanghai that lasted months. Perhaps the most dramatic moment of the Chinese Communist Party's Congress came when former president Hu Jintao was abruptly escorted out of the closing ceremony. He'd been sitting right next to Xi Jinping, when two men came to escort him from his seat. Some analysts speculated the move was an assertion of Xi's dominance. Chinese state media later said it was because the former leader was not feeling well. We turn now to look more closely at the future of China, as Xi Jinping begins a third term. Under Xi, China's continued decades-long effort to eradicate extreme poverty. Some 800 million people have been lifted out of poverty over the past four decades, and what U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres has called, quote, the greatest anti-poverty achievement in history. But Xi has also overseen a growing surveillance state to silence dissent and target ethnic minorities, including the Uyghurs. And Xi's third term comes at a time of growing tension between the U.S. and China over Taiwan and other issues. We go now to two guests. Yacho Wang is senior China researcher at Human Rights Watch. She's in New York. And in Baltimore, Maryland, we're joined by Ho Feng Hong, professor of political economy and sociology at Johns Hopkins University. His books include Clash of Empires, From Chimerica to the New Cold War and the China Boom, Why China Will Not Rule the World. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Thanks so much for joining us. Professor Ho Feng Hong, let's begin with you. Talk about the significance of what happened this weekend. Talk about who Xi Jinping is and how his policies have changed over the years. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. And uh, what happened over the weekend is very significant in the sense that uh, though we actually uh, expect it to come uh, for a while, because in 2018, uh, Xi Jinping managed to abolished the, the five, uh, two five-year term limit of uh, the Chinese uh, president. Uh, uh, that is kind of a term limit that uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, led to impose uh, in the Chinese constitution in the 1980s, because uh, after the Cultural Revolution, Deng and the Communist Party leader think that it is not good to have lifelong leader. Uh, it is good to have check and balance within the party. Uh, and Xi Jinping managed to uh, take away this term limit, so that a uh, lot like his predecessors, uh, Hu Jintao and uh, Jiang Zemin, that who each searched two five terms uh, time as, as president of China, Xi can now theoretically serve uh, unlimited term, that until he died, and he, he can be a lifelong leader of China. So this kind of uh, abolition of the term limit as a legacy of the Deng Xiaoping era uh, is significant. So it was done in 2018, but people uh, didn't believe that uh, uh, other party elite will let him actually uh, do it to have another the third uh, five-year term. But he managed to do it. Uh, it's just proven over the weekend that he managed to do it. Not only that, uh, but also he managed to put all of his own uh, loyalists, absolute loyalists, in the Politburo Standing Committee. Uh, uh, so the, the people from other factions, for example, some people who tip to be in the Politburo Standing Committee or the Politburo who belong to the Hu Jintao, the uh, previous president faction, uh, were not there. Um, so uh, it seems uh, that in the next five years, at least, uh, the Xi Jinping is established his own absolute uh, personal control of everything in China without much check and balance within the party. And talk about what happened this weekend. Do you think that was deliberately staged to remove the former leader sitting next to Xi Jinping as a message that he was consolidating his power? Or, in fact, do you think it is what uh, China said, what the government said, that he wasn't feeling well? 
definitely that uh, in this kind of a uh, carefully choreographed uh, rituals of the Communist Party, uh, it is unimaginable. There's this kind of uh, accident or incident that is uh, totally uh, out of um, nowhere. Um, and of course, there is a possibility that he actually feel unwell. But now, more video footage uh, uh, emerged from the Spanish and the Singaporean TV showing what happened. Uh, before he was uh, uh, former president Hu Jintao was escorted away from the Congress, it didn't seem like he is unwell at all. That uh, it uh, appear in those video footage that he tried to open a folder with some documents, and uh, Li Zhansu, who is uh, sitting next to him, tried to prevent him from looking at the document and seize the folder. And then Xi Jinping called somebody to come and uh, take him away. And initially. He appeared to be reluctant to leave, and then uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the guards uh, and 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 the person behind Hu Jintao uh, seems to be using some kind of uh, force to take him away, and then he eventually um, left the Congress uh, reluctantly. And then uh, after he uh, decided to leave, and he walked quite fast, and then he can walk on his own, and and it didn't seem to me. That uh, he's actually really feeling unwell, and I don't think it is the real reason that he left. And then, uh, why Xi Jinping called somebody to escort him, or even fo really forcefully take him away from the Congress? That I think Xi Jinping uh, move is uh, carefully considered and calculated to show that he can do whatever he wants, and he can even take out uh, a former president. Uh, uh, from the Congress uh, in front of the camera. And of course, that uh, people are speculating that. I think it is reasonable to suppose so that Hu Jintao might not be very happy about the, the so-called election result of the Politburo and the Politburo Standing Committee without any of his loyalists there. Uh, and uh, Xi Jinping might worry that he might give a face or a lot raising hands or a lot clapping hands. Uh, in the final section, so uh, it is a possibility that Xi Jinping deliberately uh, asked somebody to take him out to prevent this embarrassment. Yacho Wang of Human Rights Watch, your response to um, what has taken place and the significance of uh, Xi Jinping beginning this historic third term? Well, I think, uh, you know, we expect this to, to happen, because in 2018, the term limit for the president was limited. But it was still a very depressing moment, because it became a fact. You know, I talked to friends and families back in China. People were depressed, because in the past 10 years since she came to power, the horrendous human rights violations Xi Jinping committed was just striking. And now he's going to have another five years, at least. So I think people are expecting things can go worse, so people are quite depressed. But at the same time, you know, people now are very angry with the zero COVID policy. People are, you know, protesting in China with a guy, you know, in Beijing held a, uh, posted a banner on a bridge, and people responded to that. So I, on the one hand, I see people are unhappy, depressed. On the other hand, I see people are waking up and they wanted to, you know, say, I want freedom, I want human rights, I want to, you know, to decide how um, I'm governed by my government. Professor Ho Feng Hung, uh, Xi's uh, human rights record, what that means, and your assessment uh, of his rule and the effect he's had on the Chinese people, and your response to the UN Secretary General, um, Antonio Guterres, uh, talking about this, uh, what he called, uh, you know, monumental uh, taking on largest anti poverty program in history. Yeah, definitely that uh, Xi Jinping, uh, like his predecessor Hu Jintao, is a kind of a brutal repressor of human rights. And uh, uh, it's not that uh, human rights violations started in Xi Jinping. Actually, in the, in the Jiang Jiamin era, in the Hu Jintao era, we already see a lot of crackdown uh, in, in the Han majority area and also the Lan Han minority regions. But Xi Jinping but just raise it to the new level. Uh, as we are now f uh, very much aware of what happened to the Uyghurs in, in, in Xinjiang, it is uh, happening under Xi Jinping watch. Uh, so in terms of um, the repression of human rights, the Communist Party, uh, whether it is collective leadership or it is one-man dictatorship, uh, it has been pretty much the same. And what Xi Jinping uh, 
uh, brought in uh, something new compared to the Hu Jintao and Jiang Jiaming era is that he even uh, cracked down brutally on his uh, allies, his other elite within the Communist Party. Because um, after the, uh, Xi Jinping became the president, he launched its uh, anti-corruption campaign. And then uh, many uh, elites, even senior officials and private business uh, people uh, uh, disappear or uh, mysteriously commit suicide or taken to jail under the name of anti-corruption campaign. Uh, and many people will see that uh, it is a lot exciting anti-corruption campaign. It is more like a purge. Um, so uh, in China nowadays, not only uh, uh, dissidents and, and, and minorities uh, are afraid, but also some elite and middle class, and also Xi Jinping double down on uh, expanding the state sectors, uh, state companies, and making uh, private companies and foreign companies uh, uh, life more difficult in making money in in China and keeping their wealth and uh, jeopardizing their private property as well. Uh, so uh, in the next five years, at the very least, that uh, this kind of uh, draconian policy that I uh, call some kind of uh, love Koreanization of China's politics and the economy uh, is going to double down and is going to get worse. Um, and Yacha Wang, the significance of Li Keqiang, a longtime rival to Xi, uh, he's demoted, while his loyalist, Li Chang, looks like he's about to be China's new premier. You mentioned the crackdown in Shanghai. But talk about the significance of the COVID crackdown, what it actually felt and looked like in uh, this massive city. Well, I mean, it lasted from April to June for two months that, you know, that a city of 20 million people are confined to their homes. And as a result, uh, you know, people had huge difficulties to uh, have food delivered to them and to access uh, to hospitals. And I've heard stories from people whose parent has a heart attack or other emergency, and they couldn't leave their uh, uh, apartment complex, or even they managed to leave their apartment complex. They couldn't actually get into the hospital. Um, so there are people who died as a result of uh, uh, of the lack of access to hospital facilities. So, and then there are the people who were, had, they had no food. And then there are the people who lost their jobs and they couldn't pay to get the food delivered. So, the, 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 the human rights violations associated with this draconian lockdown was massive. And then, you know, it ended. And the people say, you know, Li Chang, the, uh, the, the party secretary of Shanghai, is ultimately responsible for this. Now, this guy was promoted. So, you can see, you know, she is rewarding uh, people who are loyal to his policy, rather than rewarding uh, people who are good for the, the, the public. Um, Professor Ho Feng Hung, I mean, relations with China are, if not in an all-time low, extremely bad right now. And I'm wondering if you can comment on uh, what is taking place. Uh, in one of the pieces you wrote, you said the dynamics of U.S.-China rivalry is an inter-imperial rivalry driven by inter-capitalist competition. Competition for the world market could soon turn into intensifying clashes of spheres of influence and even war. So you're not talking about a, the difference of ideologies. In fact, you're talking about a similar capitalist ideology. Yes, indeed. That uh, I myself is not quite um, um, supportive of the, the framing of the U.S.-China uh, rivalry as a Liu Cold War. Uh, it is a catchphrase uh, used a lot of time nowadays, uh, indicating that the difference uh, between China and U.S. is fundamentally ideological and political. I think, of course, that uh, this difference is real. It's very true. It's, there's a large difference. But it is not the uh, necessary and sufficient conditions that lead to this uh, rivalry between the U.S. and China today. Because right after the 1989 massacre, uh, human rights is already a huge concern about China in the discussion in the U.S., and many people already uh, are very unhappy about what is going on in China with regard to human rights and Tibet, Xinjiang. It is all old problem that uh, in the 1990s, but in the 1990s, U.S.-China relations get more and more harmonious regardless of this human rights difference and political system difference. 
Um, what uh, is different uh, now uh, in comparison to the 1990s and 2000s is that uh, back in the 1990s and 2000s, transnational corporation, American corporation, they are very happy making money in China. Uh, they have a good time in China. And so they don't care about the human rights. They don't care about labor rights. They don't care about all kind of political difference between U.S. and China. But uh, so far as they are making big money, they are finding it very profitable in China. So they lobby the U.S. government, the U.S. Congress, uh, to have a more amicable and harmonious relation with China whenever there is uh, concern about uh, labor right, human right violation. Uh, uh, in China, in the Congress, they will lobby against those bills uh, in the 1990s and 2000s. So the U.S. corporations um, uh, have been uh, kind of uh, ambassadors of the, of, the, of the Chinese government to soften U.S. policy uh, on China, uh, even though geopolitically and in terms of human rights, political system and ideology, there's already a vast difference. What happened after 2000, around 2010, is that uh, uh, China economy um, started to lose steam. Uh, the economic pie no longer expand that fast. And then uh, the market share in, in, in the, the U.S. corporation market share in China start to stagnate or even decline uh, because the Chinese uh, government is helping the Chinese state enterprise and Chinese private enterprise to expand the market share in China and around the world in the Belt and Road country at the expense of U.S. corporation. So it is a turning point that uh, U.S. corporation rarely individually uh, voice their concern about this uh, business environment in China. Uh, of course, there's also other problems like intellectual property theft uh, and unfair competition and unfair enforcement of regulation, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, they don't voice this concern individually, but in the survey, the anonymous survey conducted by, for example, uh, American Chamber of Commerce in China and U.S. China Business Council and all these kind of uh, uh, association, business association in the U.S. all show that the American business in China situation is deteriorating. Uh, they are uh, looking for diversifying their investment uh, and they no longer uh, eager to lobby the, in, in, uh, in the names of Chinese interests. Uh, so it is why the geopolitical difference uh, between U.S. and China, um, the human rights and political difference between U.S. and China can uh, now prevailed and um, uh, influenced uh, 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 largely that, uh, the direction of U.S.-China policy. So fundamentally, it is a kind of a intercapitalist competition between U.S. corporation and China corporation in the Chinese market and in the Bell and Road and other developing countries' market that lead to this deterioration of U.S.-China relation. I wanted to go to the flashpoint, Taiwan. During his opening address at the Communist Party Congress, Xi Jinping lauded his government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, addressed the economy, China's military and foreign policy. He also praised Beijing's crackdown on Hong Kong, claiming Hong Kong shifted from chaos to governance. President Xi also addressed the issue of Taiwan, which has become this flashpoint between China and the U.S. The resolution of the Taiwan issue is a matter for the Chinese ourselves to decide. We insist on striving for the prospect of peaceful reunification with the greatest sincerity and with the greatest effort. However, we are not committed to abandoning the use of force, and we reserve the option of taking all necessary measures. Ya Cho Wang, your response? Well, I think, you know, um, yes, I think it's obvious that uh, there's more aggressive rhetoric coming from the Chinese government uh, on the Taiwan issue. And I know people in Taiwan are nervous. But at the same time, I see, you know, people in Taiwan are they are very protective of the freedom, of the human rights they have. And they organize themselves together, and they wanted to retain that freedom. They are alert of the situation, and they are active in, you know, pushing back the kind of pressure coming from uh, China. And also, I'm saying that, uh, you know, governments around the world, including the U.S. government, are also, you know, doing more to support the vibrant democracy in Taiwan. So, yes, China has become more aggressive. They are more uh, you know, hostile uh, uh, rhetoric. But at the same time, I think I also see more pushback from Taiwan and the uh, democracies around the world. Professor Ho Feng um, Yang, your response? Yes, actually, it, uh, I think there are two sides of the, the, the question. On the one hand, uh, China is closing closer to uh, using military force uh, to forcefully, forcefully take Taiwan. On the one hand, because uh, the zero-COVID policy 
uh, and many things it did, uh, that Beijing did over Hong Kong, uh, show that uh, it is no longer a regime that uh, prioritizes economic growth and economic prosperity, and, and, and they prioritize national security and control, absolute control of the Communist Party. Uh, even uh, when it comes to sacrificing the economy, they will do it. So on that regard, that uh, Beijing has less restraint when it decides to attack Taiwan. But on the other hand, I think uh, the immediate uh, military threat uh, uh, is not there yet, because you look at, for example, Russia military action against invasion uh, against Ukraine, it, there's a path uh, from uh, the Russian foreign, foreign intervention and overseas military deployment uh, in Georgia in 2008, uh, Syria, uh, and also the, the Ukraine in 2014. So uh, this dictator logic is that they try the smaller scale intervention. If they succeed, they get uh, more confident, more confident, and then full scale invasion. And you look at China, if the leadership is still rational, they will look back to their military history. They will find that the last time China uh, fought a war overseas is, was 1979 against Vietnam. And the last time China actually have a serious military mobilization of this military, um, of this army, is 1989, which is against its own people. Uh, so the, China has not actually used the military against uh, uh, any overseas target. Uh, for decades, so I don't think it will easily jump from zero to an all-out invasion of Taiwan. But I think that uh, Beijing might try to uh, uh, talk up the military rhetoric, the threat, and also might even do some limited military action to take some outlying islands of Taiwan or some South China Sea Taiwan now controlled by the Taiwan government uh, as a kind of a threat or even a parcel blockage of Taiwan uh, to create a kind of a tense uh, situation to influence Taiwan election, to influence uh, what uh, the Taiwan people might want to elect for. Uh, if uh, Beijing managed to get some of its allies uh, or even its agent uh, elected in Taiwan through election, then that uh, the pro-Beijing government can, can sign agreement with Beijing and do a lot of things uh, that U.S. cannot find a reason to intervene or to, to deter. Uh, but I'm confident that uh, the Taiwan people uh, is very clear what is going on, and they have a will and they have the capacity um, to defend their vibrant democracy, which is a kind of a miracle. And it is why the Beijing find that Taiwan is a thorn on its back, because it is an ethnic, ethnic Chinese democracy and, de uh, and, and liberal society, which is very vibrant. Uh, and it shows that actually democracy um, can work in Chinese society that uh, uh, actually contradict uh, Beijing's uh, propaganda that actually democracy is not suitable for Chinese people. Uh, so uh, I'm confident that the Taiwan people uh, will have the will and capacity and, and alertness uh, to defend itself. Ho Feng Hung, we want to thank you for being with us, sociology professor at Johns Hopkins University. And thank you so much to Yacha Wang of Human Rights Watch. When we come back, midterms are less than two weeks away. Democrats are facing tight races. We'll speak with former Green Party presidential candidate Ralph Nader and author Mark Green about their project Winning America and their new report, Crush the GOP 2022. Stay with us in 30 seconds.